so hi everyone, welcome to our session on decolonizing uh, politics curricula. My name is Javeria Jaffrey, and I will chair this uh, virtual roundtable. I'm joined here by Rima Saini, Nadine Zwiner Collins, Sarah Taylor, and Tabitha Poulter. Uh, so hi, um, Rima, Nadine, Sarah, and Tabitha. Could you just um, all take a minute uh, to um, sort of introduce yourselves? We can start with Rima. Yeah, hi guys. Um, I'm a lecturer in uh, sociology and politics at Middlesex University, London. Um, I specialize in, in uh, looking at the uh, lived experiences um, and the uh, political behaviours um, and voting intentions of the ethnic minority middle classes in the UK. Um, I have to um, mention here a, a colleague of mine who couldn't be with us today but was going to be part of the original panel, Nima Begum, who um, is currently working at um, the Centre of uh, Dynamics of Ethnicity at the University of Manchester, who um, I've collaborated on recently on two articles, one in um, Political Quarterly and one in Political Studies Review, um, where we introduced our own uh, sort of, uh, I guess you could say reflexive um, uh, perspectives on um, issues to do with uh, decolonization um, and uh, politics, um, politics curricula, specifically to do with um, representation of ethnic minorities and women, um, and also sort of the theoretical and methodological impediments to introducing sort of radical um, theoretical frameworks uh, to the discipline um, in, in a way that um, maps with uh, current uh, discourses on decolonization of the of the curricula um, but I'll talk more about that later on. Thanks Rima. Nadine could you have a go at just a quick introduction? Uh, yeah uh, first of all hello everyone uh, I'm Nadine Svina Collins I'm a, a fellow at the UCL uh, Department for Social Sciences um, my research is looking more at uh, gender and gender inequality uh, in relation to political participation and political interest. Um, but I'm also involved in a lot of um, quantitative methods teaching. And this is um, uh, where basically my expertise comes in because um, I'm working with a few colleagues um, on a paper that um, discusses how and why we should um, decolonize the uh, quantitative methods curriculum. Thanks, Nadine. Sarah? Uh, hi, um, I'm uh, Dr. Sarah Taylor. I'm a visiting lecturer at uh, City University and also uh, University of Leeds, where I've been kind of just teaching all of the theory. So I've been teaching political theory, social theory, international relations theory, all the theories, and my areas of study started and have developed through um, a critical engagement with uh, cosmopolitanism and the writings of Immanuel Kant, to which I have a problem with. <laughs> Who doesn't? Um, and uh, yeah, yeah, they'll do for now. All right, thanks, Sarah. Now Tabitha. Thank you. So, hello everyone. My name is Tabitha Poulter and I'm from City University of London. I have uh, several years experience of teaching quantitative methods and my own research focuses on aid in conflict. And so my interest in decolonizing really comes from these two perspectives, both in terms of how we define and measure development and also how this is taught to students at an undergraduate level. Okay, thanks, Tabitha. I also want to mention uh, the work of another colleague who was uh, originally part of this roundtable but couldn't make it today, John Morris, who has uh, done some really fascinating IPE work on the gendered nature of primitive accumulation and also on the relationship between empire markets and uh, colonialism. Uh, so it's just us today and um, we're here today now to discuss how politics curricula can be decolonized. What does decolonization mean and who needs to decolonize? So let me begin with uh, some very quick uh, background information on how decolonizing the curriculum became a movement within academia. So a central event over here would be the 2015 Roads Must Fall protests, which uh, began in um, South Africa, the University of Cape Town. 
And these were student led and uh, were centered on uh, the removal of the statue of the colonial icon Cecil Rhodes. Uh, the protest persisted for several weeks and uh, eventually the university senate took the decision to remove the statue. And the Roads Must Fall movement uh, spread across South Africa and also globally, including um, similar uh, initiatives at, at Oxford University. Uh, the statue of Cecil Rhodes is still there, though. But uh, otherwise, uh, this became a broader movement uh, to decolonize education. And uh, we've seen initiatives such as um, these in uh, London, which are um, Why is My Curriculum White? Also, Why is My Professor White? Uh, where students have asked uh, to question the ideologies behind the curricula. And in response, uh, several departments at universities in the UK, including at uh, Cambridge, the LSE in Birmingham, have been reassessing their curricula and their reading lists to make them more uh, inclusive. Uh, however, for critics, uh, these amounts um, to tokenism and uh, they, they're critical of this because um, uh, of the way in which the works of black or female thinkers are um, presented as being of equal worth uh, merely by virtue of their color or gender. At the same time, there's an underrepresentation of teachers of color and a disproportionate burden of decolonization efforts have fallen on teachers of color and also on female teachers. Now, what does it mean to decolonize the curriculum? One um, possible summary is from Mira Sabaratnam at SOAS, who um, describes it in terms of three activities. So one, revisiting assumptions, particularly about racial and civilizational hierarchy, as these informed a lot of thinking about how the world worked and what was worth studying and what was not. Um, two, questioning the position and perspectives on an issue to broaden our understanding uh, through engaging with more perspectives. We must diversify the sources as we engage in our scholarship. And finally, three, to consider the implications of a more diverse student body in terms of pedagogy and also achievement. Now I'll ask uh, my colleague, Dr. Sarah Taylor, to take the floor. Sarah, is this how uh, you would describe uh, or summarize the decolonization initiative? And can you speak a little bit about the challenges uh, to this specific sort of approach? Sarah, could you just unmute your uh, microphone very quickly? Sorry about that. Um, okay, so I think that one of the conceptual problems with the way in which we engage with any task, engage with any at attempt to change something is the tendency to overly rely on something like these three categories, no matter how useful them, they might be. So I think that these categories are definitely useful and important to the way we think about the idea of decolonization. But I would, what strikes me of, uh, uh, when I consider the idea of decolonization, it reminds me of uh, one of the articles that we teach in international relations theory. It's the first week. It's an article by Zalewski, which looks at the different ways we, we understand the idea of theory and what we use theory for. And it talks about theory as a tool, theory as a critique, and theory as an ethos. Um, when I think about decolonization, I think, how are you thinking about it in these kind of like three categories? Are you thinking of decolonization as a tool, as a critique, or as a way of being? Now, for me, the way of being as a decolonizing individual, as a person who is a decolonizer by learned practice nature requires a radical reapproach of everything we do not just within the seminars or lectures or meetings we have with our students but with every part of our engagement with the university and with the wider world around us so for me i think about it as a philosophy of life that is expressed in a multitude of different ways based around the, the idea that we are all uncertain about what it is we're trying to achieve. So we're just trying to do a little bit better than we were. Uh, thanks for uh, that, Sarah. Can I just ask uh, Rima to chime in um, over here? But um, aside from this approach, do you, do you have any other sort of suggestions or how would you sort of envision um, a decolonized program of study? What should it look like? But um, I think also before you answer that, could you just speak a little bit about whether it is actually possible for this to happen? Is it po possible for UK uh, political science to meaningfully decolonize? 
Um, I think that's a really, um, and I think in our previous conversations where we were preparing for this roundtable, I think we acknowledge that um, uh, it's it's a very uh, I don't know how to say it. it's a conflicted process. It's a non-linear process. It's non-lateral. Um, it has to go beyond the university, um, so it can't just be limited to our own actions. But I do believe that um, there are places and parts of our own pedagogy, which um, uh, Nadine and Tabitha will talk about in a bit, um, as well as our own um, activism work, our own, as Sarah said as well, um, reflections on our own positionality um, and the way that we um, kind of live our lives uh, as academics, as teachers, um, where meaningful decolonization work can happen. Um, but there are sticking points, um, and I can briefly go over them now. And, and the uh, the idea of um, somehow wanting to normalise and mainstream decolonisation in order for it to be part of the everyday vernacular and discourse of students and staff within higher education institutions runs the risk of um, having it captured and, and becoming part of that kind of Zizekian tool of ideological pacification, where essentially what we are doing is giving lip service to decolonisation through, for example, diversity initiatives um, and not actually understanding that it is an uncomfortable and disruptive. And this is something that Sarah, um, this, this term Sarah mentioned to us yesterday, um, for it to be disruptive, it has to be radical and it has to be student led. And, and that's what we're trying to do at Middlesex University is for um, our working group to facilitate um, the discussion and uh, the action based on the discussion around the uncomfortableness that our marginalised students feel um, in terms of you know their kind of financial pressures, in terms of their um, sort of inability to, um, I don't want to say inability because it's individualizing this, but their uncomfortableness with trying to grasp the sort of um, middle class elite practices um, and, and language that we tend to, to, to exist around in academia. Can we just call that colonial language? Absolutely, yeah. Uh, but but it's you know there's there's so much more to it as well there is um i had students say to me um why do um why do why do you want us so much to cite academic literature and classical academic literature and automatically my own colonized mind says because that's the only sources that are worth citing you know these are peer-reviewed these are you know um, heavily thought out and they've been critiqued and they've been refined and they've been honed as if any other sort of knowledge is inferior um which is you know kind of our own colonial practices that that we need to to address in the process all right thank you reba uh, so I think that's really important. I, I definitely think we should uh, return to the issue of barriers to decolonization efforts and uh, specifically with a focus on students and, uh, with, you know, including issues of representation. But uh, before that, um, can I just ask Nadine about a specific initiative that some of us uh, over here are involved in? Uh, this uh, a paper on decolonizing the politics curricula through quantitative methods. Uh, Nadine, uh, in the paper, you've discussed the need to decolonize quants teaching, uh, but can methods teaching and specifically quantitative methods teaching be meaningfully decolonized? Um, thank you very much. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, yeah, thank you very much for the question. Um, that is a good question and is something that um, we have been actually asked a lot when we um, presented our work um, elsewhere. And I think it all goes back to this um, divide that still exists in um, uh, social sciences in the UK and in political science in the UK uh, between um, qualitative methods and quantitative methods. And um, the um, researchers doing um, critical race theory or those involved in um, uh, decolonization research have been traditionally quite um, critical of quantitative methods. 
um and yeah perhaps rightly so um although i want to bring in that there is we actually do see a change so there is um um some more research um going on that actually combines the two so um the whole idea of um, i think it's called quant crit so it's um, researchers that combine actually uh, quantitative method uh, methods and uh, critical race theory for example um but yeah, so in uh, in general, there is this divide, and the divide um, is basically has to do with the um, epistemological and ontological um, paradigms behind the research. So this whole idea that um, quantitative research um, is based on the idea that um, there is something like an objective truth or objective knowledge, and if we just apply um, the methods correctly, then we can actually um, get to this truth. And um, this obviously doesn't sit easily with the um, whole idea of um, decolonizing the curriculum. So the whole idea that um, our knowledge is constructed, but also um, it is heavily influenced by how we see the world and from what perspectives we come and so on and so on. Um, so um, that doesn't really go well together, but it's also true from the other side. So. Um, I can see this and I'm speaking mostly from my own experience, but also from the experience I heard um, from other people um, being involved in teaching quantitative methods. Um, that is that um, those people involved in quantitative methods teaching are not really feeling that this is a movement that concerns them very much. So there is a lot of um, uh, this idea that methods are just the tools and the tools are neutral and um, it's much easier to see why we might have to um, decolonize, for example, um, uh, international relations or political theory, but people don't really see that um, the uh, quant teaching uh, needs to be decolonized as well. Um, and this is pretty much where um, our work comes in. So we say um, there is actually a case and um, that we can decolonize um, quant methods teaching and we should be doing it. Um, and basically we have um, multiple arguments for it, but um, they uh, go along the lines that um, for one thing, um, having numbers um, and using statistics, as long as we do it in a um, reflective and in a critical, in a careful way, um, can actually help us to understand uh, certain phenomena. And it can help us understand, for example, inequalities and structural barriers and biases and so on. So um, one example um, is uh, if we want to understand what structural barriers there are to um, minority staff or students in academia, um, we can actually uh, have a look at outcomes or how many um, staff members are there. And obviously we have to be careful and there are loads of pitfalls. Um, uh, don't want to say it, it can't be problematic, but it can also be useful if um, done right. Um, and the second and perhaps more important argument uh, we have is that um, quantitative methods can do damage and statistics can do um, damage and can actually reproduce bias and reinforce power structures and so on. But um, it is much more dangerous if it's not well understood. And our idea is that we actually have to um, produce um, data users or data producers um, that can be critical themselves so that can actually identify um, and challenge um, for example assumptions um, that are made based with data and that can actually be criti uh, critical and can see that quantitative just as um, qualitative data um, has a lot to do with the assumptions we bring in and the decisions the researchers make and that can um, influence and even distort what we find. So because quantitative um, data can be a source of bias and can um, basically reinforce racist and um, colonist ideas, we need to um, actually train people in being critical of it and use it well. All right, thank you, uh, Nadine. I, I really like um, that you mentioned uh, the idea that um, s statistics and quantitative methods are seen as, as tools, as neutral tools. And I think it's very important to um, interrogate that. I just want to bring Tabitha in now and, and just ask a little more about what a critical approach is to teaching quantitative methods. Yes, thank you. So building on what Nadine has just been talking about, 
So the work we're looking at, we argue that there are several different steps that we can take. So for example, the first would be that we as teachers, we need to have a look at what we are doing and we need to decolonize our own teaching. So of course, um, this would involve having a look at our own reading lists and that is usually the go-to step that um, many people, many um, in academia will take to de decolonize their teaching. But it also means going much deeper than this to look at the content that we cover. So, um, for example, when, you know, we're looking at comparing different social and political factors between different countries, we find that a lot of the data that we are using is coming from the global north. So whether we're looking at comparing democracy, uh, trust in institutions, even comparing how developed different countries are, we see that a lot of this data has been developed by the global north. And perhaps as a consequence of this, we find that the measures that we are using are often very Eurocentric. Um, so for example, we know that some different measures of political tolerance that have been developed in Western context don't necessarily work the same way in other contexts. Um, but despite this, in our experience, teachers will, they'll still often use these Western measures as default but not only use them, um, there's often very little discussion of who has developed this data and what this means. And I know myself have been guilty of this, of just going straight into a computer lab. Here's the data, what, what, what will we do with it? There's often very little discussion about who develops this and what this means. And I have done that myself. And so we really need to get students to start thinking about where this data comes from. And I think that brings us on to the second point that we're looking at. And that's, we need to try to make this Western centrism of this data visible to students. So we need to show students and we need to discuss with them that we have a lot more data from the Global North and why that is and what the consequences of that might be. So um, there's, we. we in a lot of research methods teaching, we see that a lot of the discussion of, uh, we have discussions of data quality, but a lot of this focuses on the sample design or the sample size. And we also really should be discussing questions of context dependency too. So this would apply to all stages of data production and data analysis. Um, so for example, if we were looking at uh, question, questionnaire design, we might want to discuss um, how the wording of questions or measurement of context concepts um, should depend on the context and who we ask. And this also needs to be um, not an add-on, this doesn't need, shouldn't be the last lecture of this, the term, it shouldn't be, oh by the way, here's a footnote, it should be front and centre to our teaching. And so this brings us on to perhaps the most uh, important point is that we need to help students to become critical of quantitative data. So for example, we need to discuss um, how concepts, operationalization and measurement are not neutral, but that they build on certain assumptions and um, then can therefore produce and reproduce bias. So for one thing, uh, what we decide to focus on decides what we will ha actually have data on. And this often is guided by our ideas and what we think is worth researching. So uh, we also, um, when we think about operationalizing and how we measure things, is also affected about by how we think about concepts, but it also influences what we are going to find. So I think the main idea is that um, we need to make this much more clear to students than it is usually done at the moment and that we need to show that numbers and statistics are not neutral and whether we are producing them or just using someone else's data, um, we need to be aware that they, we are often strict, restricted by our own assumptions. Hi, thank you uh, for that, Tabitha. I just want to, um, I think, push a little more on, on this point. And, uh, you know, Nadine had mentioned quant grit and, um, you know, the concept of stats, uh, statistics, reproducing biases and um, sort of 
strengthening power structure. So does, does anybody else want to um, add anything? Because statistics is something that, uh, you know, we all come across, even if we're not quantitative researchers. And I think it's very um, important for students to be aware of exactly, um, you know, the authoritarian hierarchical nature of, of these numbers. So uh, Rima, do you want to uh, add anything perhaps? Yeah, I mean, just briefly, um, because I think Nadine and Tabitha um, covered a lot of it, um, just to pick up on kind of quant crit. So um, it's the, the way I understand, it, I guess, is kind of a subfield within kind of critical race theory that specifically deals with using um, kind of a, a critical quantitative approach to um, understand how we can um, further the cause of racial equity through statistical methods, but also how the use of statistical methods can um, obfuscate real social inequalities in society. Um, in terms of, um, you know, what I do in my own teaching um, is to meld sort of the methodological and theoretical literature on critical race theory and try and bring it into our own understanding of how um, we, we can and should uh, look at uh, and analyze data to do with social inequalities, which is the focus of my research methods teaching at Middlesex University. So an example would be of, um, you know, putting a, a ONS generated graph or table up on the screen about stop and search figures, for example, or um, education attainment um, or employment statistics that are calculated by racial groups and just getting students to actually um, break down um, what this means. So why do we frame ethnic groups like this? What are the sample sizes? How has this data been collected? Who has collected it? What conclusions do you draw from it? Um, and even amongst a group of students who are predominantly working class, most of them, I would say over 90% working um, while they're studying, um, and the majority, again, ethnic minority would say, well, what that is kind of telling me is that black people don't necessarily work that much or as much as white people. And those are the conclusions that first year students will draw based on what they read from a table. Um, and that's not a naive position to take because so many people in the public actually do take that. Um, but from that beginning stance, um, we can uh, go into all of the areas that Tabitha and Nadine talked about. So critical data analysis of existing statistics, how this feeds into um, survey methodology, how this feeds into analysis of secondary data, primary data collection, and how we can bring it back um, into the theoretical work of people like David Gilborn, um, Tafuku Zuberi, Vanilla Silva. So all of these critical race theorists from the States and from the UK who have all um, kind of been warning us for years and years of, of um, how dangerous it is uh, to not have a critical quantitative um, sort of um, education. Right, thanks uh, Rima. Those, those examples were really, really um, useful and it's really interesting to see how you sort of incorporated this into your um, actual practice. But can you uh, maybe comment a little bit on how, um, on the challenges to this sort of approach, like how easy has it been for you to do this and what sort of, um, you know, issues or impediments could, could you anticipate uh, if somebody else tried to take a similar approach? Um, so I, th I, would, I, would, I would see two key impediments to that. The first one is something um, that, um, I don't know whether we've mentioned Q-step at length here. Javara, do you want me to just go over what Q-step is? Uh, no, no, yeah, you haven't mentioned it at all. Uh, maybe you can give a little bit of background on what it is. Yeah, so Q-step is a quantitative um, kind of social science uh, funded project that started in 2013, 2014, I think, um, that was designed to impart um, uh, kind of core and elective um, quantitative methods um, teaching modules to social science students across, I think it was 15 universities in the UK? 18. 18, 18 universities across the UK. So one of the key findings of our, all of our work within QSTEP. So Nadine, Javaria, Tabitha and myself have worked within QSTEP and Sara has been there through our journey of pain <laughs> um, <laughs> over the last five years, is getting students to be excited and engaged with quantitative methods. Um, 
even putting aside the idea of decolonizing um, kind of the pedagogical, the learning and the teaching process, um, because partly because of what Nadine has talked about in terms of the way that um, quantitative methods are maligned as being um, boring, objective um, and difficult to grasp. Um, but also because, um, you know, there are huge sort of issues in terms of the pipeline to universities with students and, and the sort of um, kind of statistics training they're getting at school at further education level and a bunch of other factors. Um, and secondly, I guess, uh, Nadine, uh, Gerard, if you want me to talk about the idea of um, our own positionality and our own identities and how that plays into our, our teaching, um, and the idea of trying to connect with students on a personal level um, by our own sort of marginalized statuses. So we're all women here, we're all ethnic minorities. Um, you know, there are lots of marginalized groups here that aren't represented within our collective of um, decolonizing uh, politics curricula and decolonizing quantitative methods. Um, and a lot of those marginalized identities are within our classrooms as well. So I think it's just trying to make sure that we foster a sense of sort of inclusion, um, a sense of reflexivity um, and openness in a safe space. So a space where, um, you know, my students can say something is glib, you know, but, but, but you know, useful, um, kind of pedagogically kind of productive as, well, that graph to me looks like it's saying that black people are sort of, you know, um, less likely to, to attain first. And, and the conclusion I take from that is, you know, perhaps they're saying that we're kind of less intelligent. Um, um, so I think uh, it's important to have uh, that sense of, or at least acknowledge that sense of connection with our students. But the issue is that I was taught quantitative methods by white men, and I'm sure most of my colleagues were as well. And I was not taught it in a critical way. Um, and I'm not uh, necessarily putting all the onus on, on the teachers, um, but, you know, uh, I think having a marginalised perspective um, and having a sort of a post-colonial and critical feminist um, and racial um, kind of theoretical underpinning to your research really does help you get to grips with the decolonisation product uh, project, especially when it comes to the tricky stuff. Um, in terms of quants teaching. Yeah, thanks, uh, Rima. So, uh, Sarah, maybe you can add something uh, sort of outside the context of quantitative methods teaching. Um, okay, um, but just as an aside, I remember um, when the, the QSET program was introduced that um, I was teaching international relations theory and myths and mysteries of global politics in the international relations department. And we were told that we had to include more numbers in uh, lectures and seminars. And I remember the curious, the curious look that myself and the module leader gave each other when we thought about how are we gonna put more numbers when we're teaching about feminism and post-colonialism in a theory module. It was, it was one of those bizarre situations. It's like, we're trying to actually teach them about the underlying issues and struggles. And especially not just that, but because post-colonialism, when it's taught, that one week in the international relations module when it's taught is very much it's very much a chance to show the more narrative conversations that people like um, Mapadi and Baba come up with and the way in which that is radically different to realist and liberal and even and, and, and Marxist um, writings. So QSTEP, whilst it was a way to possibly inject more criticality, was also a colonial technique to undermine the more radical approaches, or at least it was a, a way in which it could have been un undermined, more radical approaches that I feel are an important part of teaching theory. Okay, so switching gear. Um, when we were talking about this previously in our, in our warm-up session, um, one, of the, one of the ideas um, that was uh, mentioned was this idea of best practice. So it's kind of like, as, a, as a, what are your decolon decolonial best practices? And this, and this was an idea that I, I am very cautious of. And it, this kind of ties in more broadly to the, the idea that if we just te tweak the way we teach in just the right way, just a little bit more, just a little bit this and a little bit that, we'll somehow hit this sweet spot of, yeah, now I'm properly decolonizing. Yeah, now I've got it right. And it's kind of like, this ties in more broadly to kind of like a Habermasian universalism 
concept of, you know, the way in which critical theory, capital C, capital T, suggests that we can just get it right. But I, for me, the point of decolonizing and a decolonizing attitude to the way we teach is that, no, we can't ever get that sweet spot because there is no such thing as a sweet spot. It is geographical, it's historical, it's cultural, it's ethnic, it's racial, it's gender, it's sexuality, it's disability and ability. All of these things are constantly interplaying with each other to such an extent. We have to accept, I believe, as, as, as decolonizers of our, our way of living and the, and the world around us and, and the way in which we teach is that there is no sweet spot. There is no universal that we can draw on and that we should be very wary of all of these norms that build up into a universal universalist attitude to the way we teach. So I tend to think, tend to think of, of, of scales of worse to better. Um, and part of, the, part of the reason why is, I mean, my research looks very much at kind of like the history of cosmopolitan thinking um, and the way in which Immanuel Kant's writings and his kind of like his philosophy and pure reason and all these kind of things became a part of the wider colonial second wave co uh, colonizing approach to the rest of the planet. It was the imposition of this scientific, rational, universal narrative on the rest of the planet that fundamentally changed everything about it. So for me, it's about teaching is about a, a struggle against the universal, but more than that, it's the, it's the proposal of un, new universals and the rejection of universals entirely. So it's kind of like a multi-phased approach depending on the topic at hand. So my work that I'm involved in, in it takes aim at the inherent contradictions between universalism and being different in a colonial, in a decolonizing um, perspective. I've lost my bit of the script now, bear with me in seconds. Um, and so for me, decolonizing academia is about transgressing the universal, not by tweaking the universal formula, but by producing alternative universal, oh, I've already said that, sorry. <laughs> uh, so my example of this is decolonizing the module international relations theory. Now, I suspect many of us have taught this module or are familiar with it if we if we study politics or IR. So one of the things in, way, in which it, it works is that it sets the framing of the module. It's already, it's already modular, so it's already fitting within a wider context of it. And within the module itself, it establishes the norms by which the subject is going to be taught through the way in which we understand the point of theory and then the importance of the primary theories that are first discussed. So there's almost certainly going to be liberalism and realism. So we've already established that the pragmatic comes first and the critical comes later. And then the post-structural probably comes right at the end when most of the students don't even turn up. Part of the way in which we should think about decolonizing is shaking it all up, fucking it up. So maybe we should actually consider post-structuralism post first as the way we critique theory before we engage with theory. The way we identify the inherent problems in language, in power, in knowledge, how we discipline our students into learning these subjects in the way that we ourselves were disciplined into learning these subjects, in the way we've normalized this into ourselves. So, okay, I'm gonna stop for a, for a bit because I kind of went off on one there, but I'll join in later. Yeah, we can, we can continue this thread later. I just want to let all of our uh, participants know that we can um, open up the floor to questions. So there's this uh, way to uh, raise a blue hand and uh, I can call uh, upon you once you've raised your blue hands. But, um, and, and while we wait for the audience to raise their blue hands, I just want our um, panelists to just think of a, a very quick question that we can get back to. And that is who should take this initiative? So Sarah mentioned um, the need to produce uh, an alternative universe, but who, who is supposed to do this or who, who can do this? Let's just have a look to see if we have any um, blue hands yet. Just to remind uh, 
just to remind everyone, if you want to raise your hand, uh, if you click on participants at the bottom, it should be then in the bottom right of the window that appears. You just click raise hand. Um, if you're struggling with it, just type something in the chat and then we'll be able to see that instead. And also, if you don't feel comfortable speaking for whatever reason, perhaps you have a disability, who knows, we don't know, but use the chat as well. So we have a comment uh, from Anik uh, over here. Would, would uh, Anik like to speak a little bit about how uh, this was done uh, successfully in the US? No pressure though. <laughs> Let's put you on the spot, pressure. I don't know if they're still there. Oh yeah, I think so. Yes, I'm here. My problem is uh, finding a quiet space. <laughs> uh, after school hours, so. Um, oh, yeah. Um, I could, give me one sec. Um, can you see me? Yes. Okay. <laughs> All right, I'm in the closet now, so that should work for a moment, unless the kid decides find me in here. Um, I was going to um, say that um, there was a lot of discussion about the quantitative methods and I think that's um, interesting and important but um, one of the most successful strategies that I've used, I've recently moved to Sweden so I was saying I did this when I was in the US, um, is to flip the classroom around and, and put the critical stuff up front and um, I've done this in terms of introducing um, my expertise is in, in feminist international relations and security studies um, by putting, you know, feminism up front as one of the theories that, you know, it's just one of them, right? Therefore, realism, liberalism, uh, constructivism, and feminism, and, and then carrying it through the course um, and paying attention to um, making sure that along the way, it's not the odd one out that comes at the end, but the one that comes from the beginning. Similarly, in, in a class on um, teaching uh, war and peace, it was called the politics of war and peace. Um, from my own training, I put all the war stuff first initially. And by the end of the course, I was surprised that my students couldn't imagine peace anymore. Well, I shouldn't have been surprised, obviously. Um, so I decided, oh, what if I flip it around? What if we talk about peace first? What if we imagine what that might look like and and then what happened somewhat automatically not quite of course there was a lot of thinking and um teaching involved was that the students um started to question all the accepted theories right so they said well why would you think about it this way like the strategic studies way that makes no sense where are the people right so um, by putting those critical questions to the front um and by introducing the students to maybe those things that we really think we should be striving towards, um, they themselves started to do the work. I didn't, I kind of could eventually, once I had figured out how to do it, I could kind of sit back and have them do their own work. So, so that's it's, what I this is This is really important because so often when we're teaching our students, the first few things we teach them are the things that are carried most. And if we're going to be decolonizing, then maybe the first thing we should be talking about is the effects of capitalism, of enlightenment universalism, the effects of kind of like colonization of race, the impact that it had, the, 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 the binary creation of two genders when there were a multitude accepted around the world beforehand. These are the things that are the most direct targets of decolonizing. So if we're teaching, these should always be at the forefront rather than coming along later because, oh, a lot of people talk about realism and it's a big thing in IR. It's like, yeah, but we're supposed to be trying to change it. And that's part of the point of decolonizing. Sorry. If I could just come in one more time, because I just thought of uh, one other thing that I've done quite successfully that might easily be usable for others, which is in the sort of introduction to international politics. Um, you know, we often, I was trained in Aberystwyth, we often have the story in 1919, we had the start of international politics in Aberystwyth, blah, blah, blah. Well, 
one of the things I try to do with the students is to imagine alternative starting points. What are the other points that we could be thinking of? Could we be thinking of, you know, when Columbus discovered America, right? Or what, what, what happens if we think of the Industrial Revolution? What happens if we start with all these other starting points and how does the story change? So um, that's also been quite successful. And the students know this. That's the beautiful thing. The students already know, but what we need to do is to kind of let them have, um, you know, faith in their knowledge or let them actually bring their own knowledge that they have, many of whom have come from other places and have these histories in their own families to bring that in. So I'm going to shut up, but uh, I just wanted to mention those things. No, thank you for that, Anik. Uh, we have a, a related question from uh, Alex, uh, who's asking, how do we deal with resistance within departments, such as from colleagues and uh, department heads? So wh why are gender and race always sort of the tag along lectures that come towards the end of the semester? How do we um, make them come sooner? Um, so what I would say, say is that this is a part of the always problem that is experienced all the time by people of color, by disabled people, by LGBT people. It's like you're effectively entering the experience and dynamic of those people who are already always marginalized. And this is the reason why people like Eno produce books, like why we're not no longer talking to white people about race and things like that. It's, this is always a problem and it's almost always problematic. What I would say is be cautious about trying to do it politely. Part of the Western discourse is that if you only speak to me more rationally, we will resolve this issue to everybody's satisfaction. But that's part of the way in which the existing is reinforced through the policing of language and tone and emotionality. So these are again our ways in which we need to reconsider the way we try to resolve and the way we try to change, not just the culture within our teaching modules and our lectures and seminars, but within the departments as well. So I have no answers, but I think it's even more complicated. Um, can I just chime in with um, sort of what we've been doing at Middlesex? Um, I completely agree with Sarah, don't be polite about it. I'm really lucky that I've got a, a modicum of autonomy. They don't ask me what I teach. I don't tell them what I teach. I teach what I teach. And um, I was trained in politics, but I primarily teach sociology theory now. And the this sort of trifecta of Weber, Marx and Durkheim as oh, forefathers. Yes. Of, I mean, for me, it's not, you know, I talk about Du Bois. Um, sometimes I skip forward and I talk about Hall and Shivananden and, um, you know, I've, I, was, I was never taught sociology theory. I never learned it per se. I only read about it on my own. So I teach it the way that I research it, essentially. Um, this, uh, yeah, so in terms of what Anik and, and Alex just said in the conversation chat as well, allies are great. Um, even just one, um, that's, that's one more person that's on your side. Student allies as well. Um, universities and especially senior managers they love when things come from students because students are their customers and you've got to keep the customers happy don't you um and and the union yeah can i just um basically jump on this point as well and um just say uh i find it super helpful um, just having a conversation as well. So um, in a more grassroots sense, having these conversations with colleagues, because I said there is a lot of um, resistance, for example, in quantitative methods teaching, but there are also people who just never thought about that or never had to th um, think about it. And sometimes I think it can help if you um, talk to people and you see that um, some actually start thinking about it. And I know it will be many steps then for them to actually take it on board and think about it properly. But if we can like set these seeds, I think that can make a difference already. Right. Thanks, uh, Nadine. I just wanted to push a little bit on the point about uh, involving students, like how uh, sort of viable is that to, to expect uh, a student led approach to, to um, you know, for the purpose of uh, attaining this? So, I mean, what I would say is the most authentic experiences I've had with students is when students start to trust me 
So I mean, I I, I find it much more common. Com, uh, I find it much much more enjoyable and much more in depth in in the seminars that I run for the modules that I'm teaching on. And I to get students involved, I find that I have to share the vulnerability that I often experience and in the stories of the way I've grown and encountered marginalisation. So as a queer person as a mixed ethnicity person half Pakistani half English you know I mean as a trans person as well all of these elements of vulnerability and marginalization in my experience become a part of my teaching practices and it allows a lot more students to then be open up about their own struggles and their own differences and their own difficulties that they've experienced um, so student involvement I find within the within the modules, within the lectures, within the seminars, comes from a, a, comes from a position of trust. Um, but more widely, uh, encouraging solidarity between students. I mean, the way in which they're taught is very individualized. I mean, they have the little group projects, but the dissertation is done all on their own. The essays are done all on their own, and they'll be persecuted if they try and do it otherwise. You know, so solidarity and collective experience and collective struggle is something to encourage with the students so kind of like you know they're the person who acts as the, the the kind of like the liaison between the students and the staff i mean every department has one and generally speaking they don't do much but encouraging them to build that up and engaging with them about it and showing similarities between that the way that could work and the way for example the union might work so, Sarah, I'm really glad that you mentioned um, that you sort of make a distinction between seminar and lecture. And, and I'm wondering if there's any sort of, um, uh, you know, value to that. Is, is you, do you think uh, the seminar is sort of more given to, um, to having this sort of engagement with students? I mean, I'm on a roll now. I could just keep talking if you want, but I feel like other people should as well. I mean, it, it's it's open. Uh, anyone can um, participate. Can we have more marginal voices, please? <laughs> or even in the chat. Um, I mean, briefly. Um, I mean, I think. I think it's different from institution to institution in terms of what the wiggle room is. So we have this thing at Middlesex called a lemonar. I hate the name, but it's basically like a three hour long session interspersed with breaks um, and different sort of activities. Um, and it tries to get away from that whole sort of, um, you know, the, the lecture um, power mm. relations and, and that whole sort of hour where you just have to sit there and try not to fall asleep. Um, I don't wake my students if they fall asleep. Um, can I just say that? And I think that's a decolonial practice because sleep is self-care. Um, <laughs> uh, so yeah, three hours does sound horrifying, but um, it actually it actually worked really well when I did it in my first term at Middlesex. I give them lots of breaks and we do bits and pieces and um, lots of different activities and, uh, you know, the, the energy ebbs and flows, but there, there are, you know, different ways and models of doing things. And I think it just depends on whether you have a department head or a faculty head who's open to switching things up. Um, the problem I have with academia is how long it takes to get changes implemented, though. So whether it's curricular changes or otherwise, you know, um, you know, it takes you have to be thinking of the whole year ahead. So two and possibly three semesters ahead. Um, so you do have to be on your game and you do have to be precocious in asking for for these changes to be kind of formalized. No, you're, you're um, exactly right. What, what I always uh, found interesting was that, uh, you know, because of uh, sort of understaffing and, and very heavy workloads, very often, if you're, um, if you're assisting um, the, the convener, for instance, right, and you're responsible for the seminars, uh, it, it's very likely that they, they don't really care what you're doing as long as the students aren't complaining. So there is quite a lot of uh, room there to, to sort of be, be creative. But then that's, uh, that's a subversive approach, right? It's, it doesn't really uh, sort of institutionalize the whole initiative. Gerard, do you just want to pick up on a couple of the comments we've just had? Yeah, so we have a comment from Sareya over here who agrees uh, with Sarah that trust is crucial for mutual understanding. 
Ah, uh, sorry. It's uh, how do I bring it back? Ah, uh, here we are. Trust is crucial for mutual understanding of the differences in experiences. I usually give examples from a first-hand experience from my own self and my network. I find this method as being really helpful for student engagement. Uh, there's another uh, comment from Alam. I guess I find it difficult to comment on all of this because I'm a doctoral student, not a teacher. As a student rep, I once got a complaint from a student who thought that the social theory syllabus was Eurocentric. But when I raised it with the school, I got an awkward response. I'm not surprised what can be done at my level. Can I just interject very briefly to say that you are a teacher if you're teaching? You're, you're running seminars, you're involved with knowledge and the transmission of knowledge and the creation of knowledge. You're at least a teacher, you're a tutor, you are somebody with experience. So don't think of yourself as just a doctoral student. Also, don't think of yourself just as a student, you are a researcher. So big yourself up there. We, we have a comment from Ayla on what differences for decolonizing the syllabus across different levels. So that's one, two, three. And uh, Ayla, would you like to comment on this? Yeah, sure. Um, so, I've, uh, so I'm a professor at Durham University. Um, I'm also incidentally head of department. And certainly when, and we've been pushing decolonizing our reading lists for quite a few years now. Uh, but I try to keep it as a fairly light touch so that we encourage colleagues to do so, but I don't really want to act as a you know, police person monitoring what they do. Um, the biggest pushback we get are from students and these go back and these go in both directions. You know, those who uh, want more of it and those who feel that somehow, you know, we're not presenting a, an accurate representation of the world and that in fact, uh, you know, colonialism was a good thing because it spread democracy. So we, we have quite a range of different views that we get across <laughs> across our students. Uh, and, the, you know, the challenge becomes that, you know, if a student is going to write an essay where they make that argument, and I'm not making that up, that we have to accept that, you know, there's a learning opportunity here, but, you know, they, they made an argument, um, they've used the course material, they've, you know, they've basically satisfied uh, the, the the assignment, but in some fashion, learning outcomes. But clearly, they're you know they're missing something, and uh, I feel that a lot of what's been discussed so far, you know, makes a certain amount of sense. But you're expecting a lot of background knowledge and a certain amount of willingness to engage in materials and approaches which are not necessarily familiar to the students who are involved, or for that matter, approaches that they may even be sympathetic with. Again, cases where students might be making claims that are incredibly racist and they have no idea that that's what they're saying because they just, they just don't know. So one of the, 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 question, the, the question that I have is I would suggest that uh, when we are dealing with this topic of decolonizing the reading list um, and efforts to you know, uh, address our curriculum in that regard, that there needs to be a difference from in how we address doing so across different levels. So why is it at the first year that what I've heard have been, has been an emphasis on an engagement with very particular debates as opposed to uh, a representation of how we can teach a different way of thinking about a particular subject? Or to put this differently, does the topic matter more than the skills we're teaching? So for a first year student, I would think it's much more important that we provide uh, uh, a, a, an engagement with the course material that is using the course material not as the primary vehicle, um, sorry, not as a primary point, but rather as the vehicle for getting them to think in, a, in, in various ways. That it's the skills that matter. And considering the material that we teach is largely giving a representation of the world, the function becomes what kind of teaching are we doing so that students can think critically or differently about that representation. So how do you as, you know, uh, how do all of you on the panel engage with the different challenges that different levels, not just different experiences, right? Not just different identity groups, but the different levels provide. Because it doesn't make much sense to start in, you know, the first year level um, assuming that they already know all these debates. And similarly, it may be that we don't want to teach these first these debates at the first year level anyways. Um, Thank you. Yeah. There's uh, just, uh, can I just ask uh, our administrator who's had a hand up for a bit to um, speak? Is that your hand, Chrissy? Yeah. 
is because we're past three o'clock already and it's just uh, getting no, I, now. There's, yeah, I can just see the administrator hand, but um, yes, if it's yes. not a problem, yes, Rima, please continue. It's, it's not me, it's uh, someone else's name themselves, administrator. <laughs> oh, okay. That's, that sounds questionable. Um, yeah, I think, oh, sorry, no, I was just going to say uh, br briefly, but I mean, Ilan, like, I would be really, really um, interested in, in hearing your, um, he hearing about this further. Um, so, I mean, hopefully, um, Chrissy, you can make sure that they have our contact details afterwards. Um, yeah, uh, in terms of kind of the more sort of pragmatic issues of um, do we come in and talk about um, how do we approach learning? How do we learn about learning? How do we introduce the whole concept of um, thinking critically um, and thinking within a kind of a decolonial framework um, uh, at those different levels? Um, in terms of introducing it to people that are completely fresh as blank slates and then say third years and master students who have their own um, often kind of very uh, well-formed ideas and preconceptions um, it's 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 really challenging and I just do a sort of um, a de facto sort of piecemeal trying to understand on a case-by-case -case basis um, where people are in terms of their level of knowledge in terms of their um, exposure to different debates and different theories um, and uh, trying as well to get a sense of whether they are um, interested or part of any kind of activist groups or um, whether they blog or anything like that so getting a sense of the larger framework of of what they know um, and I guess where their ideological position lies which is another really really tricky issue and I've had students before um, giving me very sophisticated um, uh, you know critiques of western colonialism not being you know um the the only sort of colonialism we need to talk about what about china and 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 India's caste system etc etc and um i try to maintain a balance and a fine line between um you know my own ideological positioning um and making sure that they um have a full understanding of the range of literature within kind of the sort of arguments that they're trying to make. So bringing, I guess, back to a, um, a more sort of um, analytical kind of way of thought. Um, it's really, really tricky, I think, is, the, is, is, is my, you know, final thought with that. And I'm not really sure. Um, I've been quite lucky in that I haven't worked within institutions or within departments where I've had a lot of that. Um, and everyone has seemed to be, you know, um, kind of very open and within the same sort of um, learning bracket within these different levels as well. Um, uh, Can I just add on? Sorry. I'm Sarah? Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. sorry. Um, just, just to add on to that is that, I mean, part of the thing that adds depth and complexity to any conversation you have with your students is the people who are teaching the module, not just in, in, in terms of, their lecturers or professors or whatever, but that they are specialists in the area that they are teaching. Now, I mean, I've mostly taught theory modules because I'm a theorist and I've, I've been lucky enough to be able to select them, which means that a lot of my knowledge is, is much more in depth than if you suddenly drop onto a module you've never taught before, like, oh, you've got to teach security studies. It's, so you're constantly trying to play catch up. So part of that as a, a head of department or somebody involved in the hiring process is picking the right people for the right job. Um, but also, and, and, and what you can get from that is, for example, when we, when, when we talk about the people who might argue that colonial, colonialism was a good thing, um, and, uh, or that they have kind of like racist, sexist, uh, homophobic attitudes is to the, the justifications that they use are quite often drawing on a very simplistic theoretical tradition and being able to engage with them and to ask them questions and to challenge them even in seminars or lectures and say well yeah but are you drawing on for example Rousseau's idea of the good you know the general well okay well let's look at that in more detail being able to have that flexibility and depth of knowledge can really help to show up some of the at least the bigger flaws in the way in which they've constructed their idea of knowledge.
So, I mean, dealing on, with ontologies and, and epistemologies and all those kind of things. So that, at least in part, I find really useful because I've had a lot of students in my seminars saying, I really appreciated that you, were, you challenged me, but not on a personal, but on an intellectual level. So, I mean, that, that does sometimes help, but picking the right people. And if you are trying to develop a decolon decolonializing attitude towards the modules, the seminars, the degrees that you are teaching, then you need to bring on more decolonial people. So let me just uh, interject over here. I just want to uh, raise a, a point uh, that uh, the person called administrator um, put into the chat, and it's about knowledge production. Uh, given that most academic journals are um, sort of inclined to publish certain types of research, how, um, how do you overcome that issue? So we're talking specifically about the requirements um, that the main academics, uh, academic journals have. Um, from authors, right? There are, there are sort of certain types of uh, papers and research that are more likely to be published and more likely to sort of be seen as uh, valid. And um, I think that goes back to the point about citation that someone made earlier. And... Um, um, Sorry, I just want to say I can't actually answer the question, um, but I just want to say it also links again in with methods, for example. We often see, unfortunately, that um, uh, certain journals prefer quantitative um, methods or quantitative approaches because they are more uh, scientific or more accurate. And then um, a lot of research that actually looks at uh, um, critical uh, race theory or looks at um, issues like um, related to decolonization um, actually won't get um, published for that reason as well. Yeah, I mean, I think with um, what, it, what is going on with UCL at the moment, for example, with the eugenics inquiry there um, and uh, how it's it's ingrained within, I think, the mainstream publishing sort of system that um, there are, you know, biases within what reviewers and editors uh, want and expect from good research and um, research Absolutely. that get highly cited. Um, but there's also, you know, there's a lot more sinister sort of kind of collectives out there. Um, uh, kind of well-established kind of professors with, with strong networks who kind of set up their own journals or have set up their own journals and they do publish um, papers that, um, you know, I would say are, are explicitly sort of uh, racist, for example, and sexist, but under the guise of, um, you know, valid and, and reliable kind of scientific research. And I'm expecting to see a huge amount of papers come out and some might even be published in the BMJ. They might already have been, for example, about how the reason that more ethnic minorities are dying because of COVID is because they have a genetic propensity and let's wash our hands of that now. Um, so, you know, there are, there is a lot more, there are a lot more sinister elements going on in, in some, um, in some spheres as well of publishing. Oh, thank you, Rima. Uh, does anybody want to uh, speak a little bit on sort of more specific tools that, that could be used? For, for what? Decolonizing broadly? Uh, just, uh, um, yeah, any sort of reflections that you might have on your, I mean, we're down to sort of our uh, final minute. So any uh, sort of, you know, reflections or, um, takeaways that, that anybody interested in, in using for their own modules, their own teaching could apply. I think this is to the audience, isn't it, Jane? Yeah, definitely uh, welcome anything from the audience. We, we've had quite a bit of time to speak. I, I mean, what, I, one thing I would say just, just briefly on that is, what does the university expect for the standard model of teaching, try and do the opposite as much as possible. <laughs> I mean, it's. I mean, if we think about colonialism as this this multi-stranded hydra that has infected, infested every single element of the way we live, experience, perceive, interact, 
it's, it's everywhere and it's all things. What does the neoliberal university system want us to do as a major arm of colonial norms? Do the opposite as much as you can. So if it says that you need to kind of like judge all the students individually, if it says that we should be using exams or this, that, or the other, resist it just as a matter of course. And especially if you have more privilege within that system, especially if you're higher up, especially if you're white, if you're male, if you're able-bodied, if you're neurotypical, if you're cisgender, you know, it's, if you're heterosexual, all of those things. Use every single ounce of your privilege that you have to resist every single element that the neoliberal university wants to produce and reproduce to reinforce colonial norms. Yeah, I don't think we can successfully decolonize if we don't um, if we don't challenge what the university is. That is a colonial, imperial, and neoliberal structure. Um, and I will again go back to my point about kind of unionizing and and resisting and um, you know not letting um, your uh, desire to maintain an academic job because they're so hard to get um, kind of fester resentment in you that uh, you are being made to to do research that you don't want to do or teach in a way that you don't want to teach um, it is kind of easier said than done um, but uh, you know it's and, and I think no no one ever said that that the process would be easy okay thank you Rima so I think uh, that that's an interesting point to conclude with decolonization as uh, as, a, as an act of resistance if uh, if anybody else um, has anything to add we have a couple of minutes otherwise we can uh, conclude the session um, Chrissy yeah, um, I think it's been really interesting, especially, you know, I'm, I'm not an academic myself, just a communications manager for Visa, but um, yeah, I think um, there's been some really interesting points made and I, I used to work at, um, in HE, so I particularly agree with the point about having to get things done at least three semesters <laughs> before you want them to happen. Um, I know, it's um, frustrating. Can I leave, that, leave everybody with a little thought? As, as my final piece of it, it's like somebody's just shared, shared on my Facebook. I know a lot of like, you know, um, I get a lot of fun, fun little images. And this is a little piece of text. It says, when you believe that niceness disproves the presence of racism, it's easy to start believing bigotry is rare and that the label racist should be applied only to mean-spirited, intentional acts of discrimination. The problem with this framework, besides being a gr gross misunderstanding of how racism operates in systems and structures enabled by nice people is that it 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 ob obligates me to be nice in return rather than truthful i'm expected to come closer to the racists be nicer to them coddle them and this is this is kind of like one of the main principles of of decolonizing as well as it, it requires you to act in a colonialism requires you to act in a certain way the rational discourse etc resistance decolonizing comes to resisting those as well i think i think that's a really good way to wrap up um so i guess i've got quite a few thank yous to say so particularly to you guys um sarah javaria um, nadine rima and tabitha and um, thank you for agreeing to do this i know that um everyone's got a lot of time pressure at the moment so we do really appreciate it um, we've had a few of our trustees here today as well with me. Um, so Naomi Head's been here, Elspeth Van Vieren, Julia Wellen. So thanks to those for attending. Um, and I also wanted to thank, I think she's had to leave, but um, Annick, who was here earlier, and um, someone else who I also met via the Visa Twitter, Brooke Ackley, who's at Vanderbilt. Um, and they really helped us out with learning how to run all these virtual events and gave us the confidence to be able to put them on. So um, yeah, thank you to those as well.